There is a text that the Lord has placed upon my heart. Found in the book of Psalms. A Psalm of Asaph. The 78th Psalm. Now, Asaph was a Levite. He was a musician in the court of David, but he was also a teacher. In fact, church music at its best is instructional, not entertaining. But this psalm before us today is not a mere recapitulation of the history of Israel. It is instructive for the generations to come. Allow me to read, starting with the second verse, through verse Eight. reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. It reads, I will declare wise sayings. I will speak mysteries from the past, things we have heard and known, and that our fathers have passed down to us. We must not hide them from their children, but must tell a future generation the praises of the Lord, his might, and the wonderful works he has performed. He established a testimony in Jacob and set up a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children so that a future generation, children yet to be born, might know. They were to rise and tell their children so that they might put their confidence in God and forget and not forget God's works, but keep his commandments. Then they would not be like their fathers, 
a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not loyal and whose spirit was not faithful to God. For a few moments, as the Lord would guide us this morning, I just want to talk about pass it on. Pass it on. Now, some institutions that we once knew and that were vibrant are no longer in existence because someone failed to pass it on. Now, if you don't have an amen, borrow one. I'm sure you have your smartphones. You may Google one. It's all right to say amen in the Lord's house. Some communities are completely in disarray because someone failed to pass it on. Some churches are mere shadows of their yesterdays because someone failed to pass it on. Some families are estranged and scattered and outside of the commonwealth of faith because somebody did not pass it on. If that's right, say amen. amen. Pastor Earl would be well aware of this and Pastor Lanier that one of the fastest growing groups that's measured by what I would call ecclesiastical sociologists is the group called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. They are the people who don't believe anything. I wish I had a witness here. They're not people who used to go to church and don't go anymore. They're not agnostics. They're not atheists. They don't believe anything. And I think the plight that we're in in America today, particularly in the black and African Negro color <laughs> church, is that we are silent about what we ought to be passing on. Oh, come on here. And, and the, key, the key to success in ministry and perpetuating the church, the local church, because the church at large, Jesus already said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, but the local church, churches go out of business every week in America. Doors are closed, and it's primarily because some folk just won't do what? Pass it on. I, I looked at this text, and I wrestled with this text, and tried to get just a little understanding of what's in this text. And I thought about the what, about, or the what to pass on, and the why we ought to pass it on, and the who is involved in passing it on. Anybody interested in helping me this morning? This is a church anniversary. 
And if you're not careful, church anniversaries can only be, can in some instances only be a sentimental journey down the dusty lane of nostalgia. Help me somebody. Trying to reconfigure in your mind faded memories of yesterday. In fact, the theme song for some would be just precious memories. Hello, somebody. But, but when I look at this text, Pastor, what, what, the what of passing it on? What is it about? The first thing we ought to pass on what's been passed down to us. Now, the reason why I need to emphasize that is that there are some people today who are trying to reinvent church. Acting as if there was no church before they got here. I, would, I need somebody my age and older. Now, I know you got your young makeup on, but talk to me. Hello. And that is that, that some of us forget that there was somebody who passed some stuff down to us. Am I talking to anybody here? The story did not begin when you got here. Uh oh, y'all, y'all not hearing me. Amen. And, and, and we've got to learn how to reach back and pass on what has been passed down to us. It's in the text. It's right there. Amen. We've got to pass it on. But, 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 but you see, you see, some folk would think that church didn't start until they got here. I can just deal with new hope. Well, no, you don't have any people like that. Because there's some people in some churches, the church wasn't anything until they joined. I don't mean no harm, but you lied and you know you lied. Hello. Because if it hadn't been something before you joined, you never would have joined. Hello. You see, you... Israel had to be reminded that the story was older than their present generation. And not only, not only do we need to pass on what has been passed down, but we need to tell the complete story. Not redact anything. You see, the challenge with a lot of us is that we like to take out the sensitive parts. Help me preach somebody. We want our children to think that we've always been holy. Uh, I can look at some of us and tell we ain't always been holy. Y'all go, go talk to me? Amen. We, we want folk to think that we've always been on the front pew. We've always been a deacon or a trustee or a Sunday school teacher or a choir director or a choir soloist. I wish I had a witness here that we've always been, but you got to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Hello. He said, we, we, we must not hide. Amen. We must not hide the details from our children. That's why it's hard to win some people to Christ because we don't tell the whole story. Because they can't figure out how to get from where they are to where we are pretending to be. And we need to tell them that I once was lost, but now I'm, I'm found. I'm not talking to anybody here. And in fact, we need to tell our children, amen. Y'all ain't hear him. I say, we need to tell our children the whole story, amen. Don't let them find it out at some family reunion, amen. I must have hit a spot right there. <clears throat> what, what do we pass on? We pass on what has been passed down. We pass on next what God has done. We pass on what God has done. 
God created us. Amen. I wish they had a witness. You need to tell your children, he made us. Am I talking to anybody here? Amen. You need to tell your children, he made, God made us. God made me. I wish y'all ain't getting it. God, 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 God made you. Amen. I said, God made you. You are no accident. You are no mere consequence. God made you. If you deal with it from an experiential point of view, ex nihilo of God, that God specializes in making something out of nothing. Now, if you don't believe he still does, that means you didn't stop by the mirror this morning. Because somebody here ought to testify that you remember when folks said you never would be. Do I have a witness here? You never would make it. Am I talking to anybody here? You never would get through. But God who creates took the nothingness of your life and made something out of it. What God has done, what God has done, he's created. He provided. He has supplied for your every need. You know, sometimes we act like we are blessing deprived. That's because we take for granted the stuff that God does for us 24-7 that you couldn't make it without. What do you mean, Pastor? He gives you air to breathe. Do I have a witness here? Amen. Try making it without air to breathe. Amen. He gives you water to drink. Hello. Oh, no, I know yet. That's too basic. That's too simple. Try making it without water. Am I talking to anybody here? He put food on your table, a roof over your head, clothes on your naked body. Am I talking to anybody here? He has supplied your every need. He has provided. Now watch this. That word provide uh, in the Latin pro video, uh, a video to see pro before he has put it there for you because he sees before you get there there, what you're going to need, and he supplies your every need. He's cre he has created. What has he done? He's created. He's provided. Hmm. He has redeemed. Now, some of you, this may miss you. But for some of us, God reached in to our self-made predicament and brought us out. Do I have a witness here? For some of us, some of you have never been in trouble. Some of you have never needed a rescue. But I think I got a few folk in here who may be spiritual first cousins to me that God had to reach his holy hand into the mess of your life and bring you out. Do I have a witness here? He brings, yes, he does. Amen. You need to tell the truth, tell the truth that you haven't always been saved, that, that he has brought you out. He has brought you through. Wait a minute. I say he's brought you through. I, I need somebody here who is on the other side of a through you didn't think you would make it through. Oh, I better say that. I lost you. I, I need somebody here who is on the other side of a through you didn't think you would make it through. No, some of you still sleep. I said, I need somebody here who's on the other side of a through you didn't think you were going to make it through. I heard folk up here doing the prayer, crying out unto God. They're not the only folk who've cried. I don't know why you want to look at me funny. They're not the only folk who came up here with their hearts burdened. Amen. They're not the only folk who cried out to the Lord and then say, said, I don't know how I'm going to make it. But here you are this morning on a Sunday morning, which is proof that God has a way of bringing you through. He redeemed. He brings you out. He brings you through. He brings you to. You see, when God delivered 
Israel out of Egypt, he wasn't bringing them to Canaan. He was bringing them unto himself. Y'all ain't getting it. You see, prosperity theology will make you think God specializes in places and possessions. But God specializes in personal relationships. God brings you out and brings you through, not to take you somewhere, but to bring you to him. Do I have anybody who knows that God used that to get you to him? Anybody knows that he brought you to him? Hey, oh, no, y'all ain't playing with me. You see, you think God's going to take you to a place. God is bringing you to his person, to him. What, what, did, he, what did he do? What has he done? He's created. He's provided. He's redeemed. He's performed. He's done stuff that is beyond your imagination and expectation. Hmm. Do I have anybody here who has had God to blow your mind? I mean, God has done some stuff that you couldn't even imagine. In fact, the way you imagined it working, working out was far less than the way God worked it out. Oh, I need somebody here who knows that God has done marvelous things. I say God has done marvelous, marvelous things. Marvelous things, things that are beyond your mind. Anybody got some stuff you just can't figure out how he did it? Amen. God has performed marvelous things. Can I give you a couple of examples out of the history of Israel? Here they are at a Red Sea. Just been brought out of Egypt at a Red Sea. And, 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 and Pharaoh thought he had them. Anybody ever had your enemies think they got you? I mean, they chased you up to your Red Sea. I, I don't know if I got, but I maybe have one person in here who's had a Red Sea experience. All of a sudden, God blew his breath on your Red Sea and parted the water, and you walked through on dry ground. You can't figure out how you got there, but old mama would say he made a way out of no way. There was a place in the history of Israel called Myra. Uh, the people of God, after they got across the Red Sea, uh, they headed toward the wilderness of Shur, and, and on the way they got thirsty. And when they got to the place where water was, the water was bitter. If I had Bible students here, <laughs> water was bitter. They were, they were excited to see the water, but when they got there, the water was bitter. They recognized that it was water, and their mouths began to even, just even what little moisture was left, was to begin to wet itself in anticipation of this water. But when they got a hold of the water, it was bitter. I wonder if I got somebody here who's ever been thirsty and you got to what looked like water. In fact, it was water, but it was bitter. I wish I had a witness here. Oh, don't make me break it down. Do I have to break it down for you? Amen. That, that job that you thought was going to be just the right job. And when you got there, it was bitter. I wish I had a witness here. Oh, don't act funny with me. That, that, that house that you thought you had to have. Hello. Amen. When you got into the mortgage, it was, come on, help me here. Oh, y'all still sleep. That boo you thought you had to marry. Don't look at them. Don't say nothing. 
Just look at me. Just wink your eye. Because I'm going back to Detroit and I can't counsel nobody else. Hello. But do I have anybody here who's ever been at a Mara, a bitter place in your life, and God got a hold of it and turned your bitter into sweet? Do I? Oh, somebody ought to really shout right here. God took your bitter situation and made it sweet. I wish I had a witness here. Amen. That, that old mean job, that boss, I wish I had a witness here. God got a hold of him. Am I talking to this? Y'all ain't hearing me. You, you, you found out you got a refinance of your home. and Y'all ain't talking to me here. And, and some got a hold of that hard-headed spouse of yours. And then you have to look around and sing that old song. There's a stranger in my house. I'm, I'm gonna get out your way. I, I got why? Why should we pass it on? Why? It's on the text. Why should we pass it on? And, and before I get to the why, I got to go back because it's not only what he's done, what he said. I'm mighty afraid some of our churches are going to die in the promised land because they've chosen to practice a subjective theology versus an objective theology. What do you mean, Pastor? They've chosen to redesign God's word to their own liking. And they reject, I wish I had a witness here, the objective, thus said the Lord. Am I, y'all don't, don't like me. I know, I know you don't like that. We, we, have, we have rewritten the word of God. And listen here. Now, now I, I, I know everybody's dealt with it. And, I, and I, I need to say it. And if I, my keys are locked up in the office. I can't even leave. Let me, let, let me say this. God, God has given commandments, not suggestions. Oh, yeah, no, no, that's old school, Pastor. No, commandments. Hello. And the first portion of them deal with how we ought to reverence him. God is not your buddy. He's not your ace boon coon. He's not the man upstairs. Do I have a witness here? He is God and God all by himself. He is holy. Do I have a, y'all ain't talking to me here. Amen. God tells us how we ought to reverence him. Then God tells us how we ought to relate to one another. We wouldn't have the, the foolishness, the chaos, the anarchy that we have in our communities if we just knew what God said. God said, thou shalt not kill. Help me hear somebody. God, God said, thou shalt not steal. Oh, no, y'all ain't hearing me yet. God said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Oh, y'all not hearing me. God said that man should not sleep with man as with womankind. Oh, y'all ain't like that, did you? Amen. Can I break that down? Amen. I don't care what the courts say. In the beginning, God created Adam and Eve. Amen. Not Adam and Steve. Hello. Not Eve and Etna. Hello. Y'all don't want to help me here. It says, for this call shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, not to his husband. Y'all, I, I know, I know, I, I know, I know. Now, now I'm going to tell you why God said that. God said that because he knows what it takes to maintain community. When you disobey what God has said, community breaks down. Y'all ain't helping me here. If I had some, some world history majors, they would tell you what happened to the Roman Empire. 
the Roman Empire fell because people did things their own way and not God's way. Well, let me hurry and get out of your way here. Why? We tell the story, we pass it on. Why should we pass it on? So that they, the generations, might know what God has done and what God has said. That they might know, amen, what God has said. They might know what God expects of them. It's not too early to tell your children what God expects. I wish I had a witness in the house. It's not too early to tell them that God expects you to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Y'all got quiet. It's not too early to tell them to love their neighbor as you love yourself. Am I, am I talking to anybody here? It's not too early to teach them that God expects you to love him and him alone. Amen. That they may know. That they may have confidence, place their confidence in him. I don't get it. I don't get it. Our children are growing up trusting everything but God. And it's our fault. Because we have not told them about what God has done so that they could trust God. I, now, see, you got real quiet. You see, when you tell your children about what God has done and you just the position the unfaithfulness of man towards the, against the faithfulness of God, they learn to trust God because God never changes. Even though we change, he never changes. Do I have a witness here? You can trust him because he keeps his word. That they may know, that they may have confidence. That they may not lose sight of the works of God. In Judges chapter 2, there's a very awful verse. There's an awful verse that says, And there rose up a generation that knew not the works of God. If you're not careful, New Hope, there will be people here who don't know what it cost you to get here. Preach by yourself, Pastor. There'll be people who didn't realize, as the brother was saying with his litany, his historical litany, that you didn't start in this. Preach by yourself, Pastor. That there are some folk who, if they don't know what God has already done, they will have amnesia toward the works of God. The last thing is that they might, that they might be loyal. We live in a pluralistic society. Pluralism breeds disloyalty. Pluralism says that there are many ways to God. Pluralism is the first cousin or pantheism turned inside out. Pluralism says that there are many gods, many ways to one God, but many gods with one way. Hello, somebody. And that you can serve any God you want to serve as long as you're serving God. But how many of you know that God is a jealous God? I tell you, God is not a jealous God because he's afraid of being replaced. He's a jealous God because he don't want you to get hurt. I wish I had a witness here. He don't want you to hook up with something that can't deliver. I wish I had a witness here. So let me let me hurry and get out of your way when I get to the who in the text. The who in the text, first of all, is about the redeemed. The redeemed. Did I say something strange? I said the redeemed. Well, there is a verse that says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I said the redeemed. Do I have anybody here who's been washed in the blood? Who's had their garments washed white as snow? Do I have anybody in the house who's been brought out of darkness into light? Do I have anybody here who's been brought from death to life? 
I'm talking about redeemed folk. Do I have anybody here who once was blind, but now you see the redeemed? But there wouldn't be any story if it wasn't for a redeemer. And there are three titles in the text. There is uh, Elohim. There's El. And there is Yahweh. El is the name of God which expresses his mightiness. Anybody knows that God is a mighty God. I said, does anybody know that God is a mighty God? God is so mighty that he's all of everything. He is omnipresent. That means everywhere you go, he is right there. He is omnipotent. That means he has not some power, but all power. He is omniscient. That means that he knows everything. He is omnibenevolent. That means he's good all of the time. Do I have a witness in the house? But he's also Elohim. And I told you a little while ago that that means that he specializes in making something out of nothing. Anybody ever had God take your nothing and make something out of it? But he also is Jehovah Yahweh. That means the God who is the self-existent God. He has no birth certificate because who was the midwife who delivered him into this world? He'll have no death certificate because what funeral home, what coroner will sign his death certificate? He is from everlasting to everlasting. Do I have a witness here? Well, can I go down the road right quick? He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the Lord, my provider. If you know him, help me right here. He is Jehovah Rapha. He's your doctor in the sick room. He is Jehovah Shalom. He's your peace in the time of confusion. He is Jehovah Nishi. He's your battle axe in the time of war. He is Jehovah Shema, the God who is already there. Anybody knows who he is? He is Jehovah Yeshua. He's the God who brings you out, brings you through, and brings you in. I got to go to my seat right here, but if you can help me close, I'd sure appreciate it. Find you a neighbor and say, neighbor, I need to pass this home to you. And here it is, neighbor. If it had not been for the Lord on my side. today. He rocked me in the cradle of his arms when he knew I had been battered and scorned. If it had not, oh I need some storytellers here. If it had not, I said if it had not, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? Do I have a witness here? I'm going to my seat, but can you find one more neighbor and say, neighbor, through many dangers, toils and snares, I've already, I said I've already, I need some all 
already spoke here. I've already. No, I just wait a minute. I said I've already. 